Right. So um, I thank the Lord for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be here in um, North Africa, the Middle East, and at many ministries. In fact, at um, six different opportunities to uh, meet with different groups of people. Um, first was a group of 25 from seven uh, Middle Eastern Arab countries, leaders of teams here that uh, was able to share on mentoring. Um, and then another group of um, 60 plus from 29 countries here for the launch of a um, training program, a leadership training program. And then met four different groups over um, the week um, here in Egypt itself. You know, um, one disciple making group um, from 20 over churches came together and uh, that was really wonderful. Um, and just to hear their testimonies and what's been happening, um, I, I, I'm just awed that, you know, I'm so, I should be learning from them because they are so much more <laughs> successful at what they are doing in terms of uh, disciple making. But I uh, was able to share with them um, a little that I know as well. And then um, a men's group that reached out to uh, about 800 other men uh, through Adventure. Um, it's a life-changing thing called the Four Musketeers, uh, which is really excellent. Um, and then um, with a group, a big group of about 60 plus of them um, who are part of the um, sports ministry team here right? and uh, from different churches as well. So that's really been uh, wonderful. And um, I'll share a bit uh, later on. One of the things in which the Lord has put on my heart um, at the beginning of this year um, has been the very word deep. So deep is my word for the year, you know, and uh, sense that the Lord wants us all to go. Now for me, once to go deeper um, in terms of um, understanding his love, to go deep in his word, um, just go deeper. Um, deep calls to the deep, and I felt that this is a call for me and, and, and so my messages, my my thoughts, my conversations that I have with people all surround this you know, and it's been wonderful of, for myself definitely uh, that God is um, drawing, as I draw near to him, he's drawing near to me so I just give glory to the Lord. Huh? So Father, I just want to thank you that today even as being prayed of you, more than once that uh, your word may not return to you void or empty. Father, that you will accomplish everything that is set out to do. Holy Spirit, may you be the one that lead us and guide us to all truth. That, Lord, this truth will truly set us free and help us, Lord, to discipline ourselves, to come to your, that place in our lives when we have, we'll make that decision of um, seeking, going deeper into you, Lord, for your word has promised us that you reward those who seek you earnestly. Father, you have said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And so, Father, we come asking, seeking and knocking. That indeed, Lord, that uh, your presence in our lives will be so real, so tangible, so strong. That, Lord, everyone around will see the light, Lord that we will all shine like stars in the universe, that people will know the evidence of your presence in our lives to be so real and powerful. For this we pray, Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, you know, um, I can only thank the Lord for um, Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline, and uh, read it about 30 years ago, um, impacted my life, uh, try to walk that journey, but uh, over the last 30 years, the journey has been up and down, it's been difficult, there's been you know, a lot of distraction, the things which we do, um, and sometimes we, we, we like that practice uh, of the spiritual disciplines, and then last year I read the book again, it was a good reminder, and uh, this year, someone from another group was posting it you know, every week, uh, the different chapters. And so it was very good for me as well to refresh my mind and to uh, remind myself the things I need to do. And together, my wife, we've been trying to discipline ourselves by um, drawing in this manner as well. Right. 
Uh, what are the spiritual disciplines? Richard Foster in his book, he gives us three um, you know, uh, movements, the inward, the outward, and the corporate. In the inward, talks about prayer, fasting, and study of the word. And that's so important. So if we want to grow inside, internally, we want to grow spiritually, we have to speak to the Lord. We got to listen to the Lord. We got to be serious and fast and, and, and to, you know, when we stop feasting on um, the food of this world, we begin to feast on his word. And then that goes deeper and we want to study um, and meditate, you know, on the word of God. Um, outward will be how we live our lives. Simplicity, well, you know, our lives is very cluttered, right? And so we need to um, simply live the others may live simply. You know? and, and then solitude. And how we need to sometimes just um, give space to ourselves to allow um, the inner man to, to be still, to be quiet and learn submission as well. You know, and we submit to the Lord and to his will and we submit one to another as well. And then service, serving with the gifts that God has given to us that we may be able to um, bless others as well. And then corporately, we just come together and worship, you know, and um, that's really powerful. Every week we learn some new expression of worship that expand our repertoire of how we can truly come to the Lord um, with creativity and with our whole being to worship him in spirit and in truth. And confession is very important too because you know, as we confess our sins to the Lord, we are forgiven. James tells us that when we confess our sins one to another, we are healed. You know? And so we want to go deeper as well, even in um, the confess confessing of uh, where we are and what we've done, to one another so that the enemy will not have a foothold in our lives and always seeking guidance, um, not just for ourselves and by ourselves, but corporately coming together. You know, like in church in Antioch, when they came and they prayed, they worshiped, and then they were led by the Spirit to set aside Paul and Barnabas and send them out for missions. So corporate um, seeking of the Lord for guidance and definitely celebration um, is both uh, um, not just for uh, celebration, self-celebrating Christ, but celebrating all the disciplines because the disciplines are not there to bind us and, 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 and to be a burden to us, but the disciplines are there for us to celebrate, even celebrating fasting, celebrating sub solitude, submission, service, and confession, celebrating all that because in every one of these um, disciplines, it is to free us to become a man and woman that God wants us to be. So there are various lists by various groups of um, authors who, who shows us um, what are the disciplines, of Christian disciplines that we can practice. Um, when, Christ, when we speak of spiritual discipline, what we normally mean is this regular practices that that we, we put into place in our lives that will benefit us personally and also will produce fruits, all right? And, and um, you know, as we practice this, we become stronger um, spiritually and, um, and our behavior can also change. But And it is a daily exercise, things that we do, right? If we want to grow muscles, we have to go to the gym, we've got to exercise, we want to build our capacity, our lung capacity, we can swim, we can run, we can, you know, so as Whatever we want to build um, in ourselves, we need to put it into practice. So the text for today is uh, 1 Timothy 4, right, 7 and 8. It says, have nothing to do with godless myth and all wise tale. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. You know, um, being involved in uh, the sports ministry, you know, like we, we always have the physical trainings, all right? Whether you're playing a sport or even health and fitness, um, there's, there's value in, in training. You know, my wife always tell me, if I just anyhow eat, uh, eat everything and anything, and eat too much, right? Uh, put on so much weight and um, bad for my heart, bad for my internal organs and 
we cannot serve the Lord long. As, you know? So he said, you want to serve the Lord longer, then you got to be physically, you know, um, good, right? Pursuing optimal health, you know, he always say. And, um, and so, but the Bible also say, yes, there is some value in physical training, but godliness is what we need to focus on to train ourselves to be godly because it holds promise for both the present life and also the life to come. Um, wait, um, let me just change that. Okay. So what kind of spiritual life would we like to have? A question that will come back at the end and um, ask each one of us as we bring it to groups, right? Uh, what kind of spiritual life would you like to have? And how do you think you can live such a life? Because whatever we want, we need to have um, a plan, a way in which we open up ourselves to allow the spirit to guide us, lead us, and to build us up and to mature us, right? So we truly need to develop uh, spiritual disciplines so that we can live the kind of life that we want. So we need to set goals. We need to know uh, for ourselves, um, if we want to go deeper in love with the Lord, then we need to really find time to spend time with the Lord, speak to him, hear him, read his word, pray, you know, and <clears throat> having goals is one thing, but we have to put it into our schedule. We have to plan when or how and what we need to do and then put it into action, implementing, implementing the things, the desires of our heart. Then we can see success, <clears throat> see growth in our lives. And so we need to train ourselves to be godly, the word tells us. Um, when, when we are talking about training, you know, there are many things in which we need to do. Um, firstly, we need to have a target, a goal. Um, if you want to be an Olympian, wow, that's a totally different ball game altogether, right? Um, yeah, so physically, athletically, most of us will not go to the Olympics. But how about spiritually? What kind of Christian are we going to be? Are we going to be um, a primary school level um, believer or secondary school believer, a, a, a kind of graduate kind of um, believer? Uh, ultimate, you know, um, Olympian kind of a, a believer. Whatever we want to be, we need to train ourselves, okay? Because in every level, there are tests. In every level, there are things in which be able to um, quantify where we are in our walk and journey with the Lord. So, um, 1 Corinthians 9 tells us, um, we do not know, uh, do you not know that in a race, all runners run, but only one gets the prize. So run in such a way as to get the prize. So we have to set a goal and we need to move in, in that direction where we will attain the things in which we believe that we want. And it says, uh, we need to go into strict training, right? For everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training and they do not get a crown um, that will last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And so if we are going to be rewarded or going to attain this crown that lasts forever, how much more stringent, how much more commitment must we have in going into this training, to train to be godly? And it continues to say, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave you know, so that, I, that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. Now, this really speaks to me. You know, as I, I share, I teach, and the teacher is a lot definitely more accountable. But I think for all of us too, as we want to um, journey to become a better um, disciples of the Lord, better followers, then we need to really train ourselves, right? Training ourselves to be godly. So what are the spiritual disciplines? As we have said, I don't know, we've given a list, but uh, what do we want to do with it? 
right? Um, but why? Why do we need spiritual disciplines? Okay, I will talk about that a bit later. Um, so we, we shared this earlier, the daily exercise. What do we need? Why do we need spiritual disciplines? Because of superficiality. It's about we don't go deep. even in our relationship with one another. If we really be honest, I I I have to confess that many of other relationships I have are very superficial. Only a few, you know, go deeper, and only two or three that I can say are very deep. And the thing is this: it sometimes reflects the kind of spiritual um, journey or spiritual walk that we have with the Lord. Some are deep for some people, but for the most of us, even our walk and journey with the Lord is superficial. And so we need to get out of this. And that's why I think the Lord put this on my heart that I need this, you know, I need to go deeper. I need to become um, more aware of his presence and his desire to want me to go deeper and to uh, allow me to experience even more. And I believe that this is for all of us. The desperate need today it's not for more intelligent people, more gifted, more creative, um, but able to do more with the little that they have. But with the, the true need is for deep people, people with wisdom, people that has the Lord in them, and people who know what the Lord wants from them and for the rest and for others as well. But what is needed simply in us is this longing for God a desiring, because the psalmist says uh, in Psalm 145 verse 18, says the Lord is near all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. And this is the thing, it says, it says this is the promise that he is near us. And even King David, right, um, in Psalm 27 verse 4 says, one thing have I asked of the Lord <clears throat> that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now here is the king, king who has found favor in the eyes of the father. All right, even as a young boy, when he was anointed right, to be king by um, the prophet Samuel, even as a boy, <clears throat> he experienced the presence of the Lord. With boldness, <clears throat> he went to fight the lion and the bears. And then, the giant, and it took him a while before he became king. But here he is now, um, the king of Israel, powerful, won many battles, great reputation, and he can ask anything of the Lord. But he says, one thing I ask the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He could have asked for many things, for more power, more strength, more wisdom, like Solomon did. Um, but he simply asked to be able to be in the house of the Lord. To do what? To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. To just revel of his goodness and his holiness. To enjoy God's presence and to be able to inquire of him in his temple. To seek God's will so that he can align his will to the will of the Father. No wonder you know, the Lord said of him, you know, after removing Saul in Acts 13, 22, it says, after removing Saul, he made king, uh, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do everything I want him to do. A man after my own heart, because he was a man who seeked after the presence of God in his life. The one thing he asked was that he was be able to just dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to gaze upon his beauty and to inquire of him so that he can do everything that the Lord puts on his heart. So God knew that and commended him for that. And that's why David was truly um, a great king. You know, as far as Israel was concerned, he was the best. That was the golden age of Israel. Hebrews 11.6 tells us this. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those 
who seek him. So like David, a man of faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, the context of this uh, verse in Hebrews 11, 6 is the verse before. that says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So what did he not do to please God? Did he move, pray with faith to move mountains or to part seas or to call fire from heaven, to walk on water, to, to heal the sick, to bring the dead to life? <coughs> All he not did in Genesis 5, 24. One verse that described him, less, as much as we know about Enoch, Enoch walked faithfully with God. And then he was no more because God took him away. So his fame to faith was that he faithfully walked with God. And God was pleased, commended him you know, for being one who pleased him. Just like David, a man after my own heart, who only sought uh, to be in his presence, to be in his house, to gaze at his beauty and to inquire of him. And when I was thinking about this, I says, because what can we do for God? He made the world, he made the universe with his breath. He spoke it and it became. Does God need our help to do anything, to accomplish anything? He allows us to be his co-workers. He empowers us that we may be successful. But what he truly desires is for us to walk faithfully with him as Enoch did, as King David desired. And so we are to draw near to God because that pleases him. To believe in him and to believe that he rewards those who seek him earnestly. So as we draw near to him, you know, we must also believe because he says, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. But when we draw near, we must believe, you know, um, John 14, 12, very, very, I tell you that if anyone who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall also do. But even greater things than this, because it pleases the Father for us to believe, to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So when we come believing in God, who is able and who's willing and who's loving, and, and you know, when we come to him, bringing all our cares, do not be anxious about anything. But everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, making our request known to him, that pleases him as we put our faith in him. And then believing that he will reward us as we earnestly seek him. James 4 also tells us to submit ourselves to God then. Resist the devil and he will flee from us. Come near to God and he will come near to you. And so we need to wash our hands and purify our hearts. Right, coming to him with clean hands and pure hearts, but seeking after him, coming near to him because he will come near to us. So the purpose of spiritual disciplines is to free us, not to enslave us, to give us this um, understanding that he is in us, he is with us, and we can accomplish all that he has called us to do. But many of us simply do not know how to go about exploring this inner life. And it took me many, many years, and I'm still seeking, still learning, wanting to go deeper. And that's why I believe God is drawing me um, deeper into him and teaching me. And, and the little that I know, I like to share. But many others too, like myself, we've been distracted, too busy to go about exploring the inner life. Watchman Nee once said this, and it says, many of us want to work for God, but we forget to work with God that we, we, we miss out on the intimate relationship where we are co-workers. We are not just workers for the Lord. We are co-workers. That means we have to work alongside, working together, and not get too distracted, too busy, even for good things, that we miss out on the relationship. No, we want to work together so that we can enjoy each other's company, enjoying the Lord's company. Richard Foster said this, no? the spiritual disciplines are an inward and spiritual reality where the inner attitude of the heart 
is far more crucial than the mechanics for coming into the reality of spiritual life. What does that really mean? Is that the life that is pleasing to God is not just a series of religious duties, how much time we pray on our knees, how much time we read the word, how much fasting do we do, um, and all the, you know, we meditate on the word. All these are good, but it's not the mechanics. It is the inner heart, the attitude. It is about us wanting to enjoy his presence that makes that difference. Like what King David did, you know, he says, the one thing I ask, the thing that I seek the most is to be in your presence, Lord. To, to seek after you, to, to enjoy, to understand who you are, and to be able to align my will to your will, Lord. I went up to um, Asur, uh, this city. Um, they call it Upper Egypt, but actually it's in the southern part because it's in Upper Nile. You know, and we went to this convent, convent of the Virgin Mary. Um, they believe that uh, um, Joseph... Mary and baby Jesus came there when they were running away from Herod. And so they built this whole complex. There are over 10 churches in this whole uh, complex. And uh, much of it is in a cave, cave kind of um, like um, church. They believe that the cave was used for storage for grains by, by Joseph. But what was said was there that there was a lot of superstition, belief and our belief of practices that uh, they were doing, you know, touching relics and um, even popes that um, led the Coptic church you know, before. This is the Coptic um, church. And, and I also discovered a lot of things about Christianity in Egypt, right? The Coptic church is the biggest and then the Catholic and then the evangelicals. Um, and about 15% of all of Egypt is um, supposed to be Christian, but mostly by name. But still, 15% is a huge number of over 100 million uh, people here in Egypt, right? But the thing is, sad thing is that uh, for many of them, their, their faith is in, not in their relationship with God, but in just going there, saying some prayers. Um, in fact, someone was telling me, you know, if they said um, that the that the Lord is good or something like for a thousand times, then all your sins in the past will be forgiven. And then um, your sins now will still be forgiven. And so they can, after that, they can, they are forgiven and they go off and then they continue sinning. And then next week, come back again and say a thousand times and then you'll be forgiven. All this superstition and, and, and it's very sad. Um, but God wants us to know him even better. Now, any Arnold said this, no. We want to make it quite clear that we cannot free and purify our own hearts by exerting our own will. The moment we feel that we can succeed and attain victory over sin by the strength of our will alone is the moment we are worshipping the will. When we think we can, because we have the desire, the willpower to change ourselves, we then worship ourselves that we think we can do it. As long as we think we can save ourselves by our own power, we will only make the evil in us stronger than ever. Well, very strong words. It says we need to come to that place where we understand that apart from him, we can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. So we cannot attain or earn this righteousness of the kingdom of God. It is given to us. This grace is given to us. For... Um, by the, the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the grace of righteousness reign in life through that one man? We have to understand this, that God has abundantly provided for us his grace and given us this gift of righteousness through his son. Abundant provision of grace. I like that. You know? It's not just giving us grace, Give them multiple abundant provision. And then some of us on the flip side, you know, will be tempted to believe that, oh, then there's nothing I can do. I just, if God doesn't give me this give, God doesn't give me this grace, then I cannot. No, that's not true either. God has given us the disciplines of spiritual life as a means of receiving his grace. You know, if it rains, 
and the farmer did not prepare the ground and sow the seed, then there will be no harvest, isn't it? God may send the rain, but if we don't do the work, the hard work of tilling the ground, um, putting the soil, uh, the seed in the soil, making sure that the, the environment is right, then nothing will happen. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So what are we sowing? What are we spending time on, on our daily life? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us hold on to the grace. Let us hold on to grace because by it, we may serve the Lord acceptably. So it is holding on to grace, understanding that all that we have, this abundant provision that comes from God, as we learn to revel in this, then we are able to serve the God acceptably with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. So the more we understand, the deeper we go in appreciating his love for us, then we can love others as he loved us, love others as he has loved us. Freely receive from him, freely we give. So a farmer is helpless to grow green. We all know that. All he can do is provide the right conditions for growing of the grain. Paul tells us, he says, I planted the seed, Paulus water, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. And so it is God who does make it grow, but still someone needs to plant, someone needs to water. And the disciplines are God's way of getting us into the ground. They put us where he can work within us and transform us. I like the, this quote from Richard Foster that the disciplines are simply allowing God to place us in that place where he will want to work with us, renewing our minds so that there will be transformation. So the seed needs to be in the soil or else the enemy will come, right? If it's in a hard ground, take it up. It needs to be in the soil so that the, 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 the shoot uh, can reach out, uh, to burst out of the ground, to reach out into the sun, so that, you know, um, through that, they can grow. And then the roots will start going down, reaching out for water and nutrients, okay? And so we need to also, as the word says in Colossians 2, 7, be rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as we have been taught, overflowing with thanks, uh, thanks, thankfulness. And so we all need to be rooted. So today, the message is simply to remind us of the importance of the spiritual disciplines that we all need to have, to put them into practice, being rooted and built up in him. Rooted, we need to take in the nutrients, his word, spending time in, in the dark. The roots are always in the dark, where people cannot see. You know, um, the things in which we are built up on top, things that are evident, our faith, in praying for people, um, the way our, uh, the way we speak to one another, uh, uh, is it seasoned with salt? Is it gracious? Is it an app word that are uh, helping people? Things that are evident people can see. Done by faith, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. All right? And so there, there's a lot of um, those things that we do that are under the soil, in the soil, the roots going down but people do not see. And so we need to discipline ourselves to spend time allowing God's word, God's spirit to build our inner man. So what kind of spiritual life would you like to have? How do you think you can live such a life? And what must you do in order to change the things in which you're doing now in order to get to where you want to go? Which spiritual disciplines but we need to practice to help us accomplish those goals. And so for, for Serena and I now, um, when we are at home, um, we will get up earlier and we'll go down to the coffee shop for um, coffee before I send off to work. 
and we'll spend time and drop the day to be mindful. And we'll be sending each other messages when uh, God puts something on our heart and to remind us to pause, you know, um, uh, this, this um, Apple Watch um, of, you know, has this mode, uh, says mindfulness. And it reminds you certain time of the day to start being mindful. And I thought it would be very helpful, you know. Um, and then when I'm reminded, I remind Serene as well. And we need to remind ourselves. And we ask the Holy Spirit to awaken our spirit in us, that his spirit may witness to us so that we can, can want to conform to the will of God, to be able to inquire in his temple like King David. And this is my prayer for all of us, that we will take time to evaluate where we are. What is it that we want? What kind of spiritual life would you like to have? What's needed now that needs to change so that we have be able to um, have a plan and put that plan into practice so that we can succeed in becoming the kind of follower that we intend to be, that he intend for us to become. Let us pray. Father, I just want to thank you again for my brothers and sisters here at uh, Ex Baptist. We pray, Father, that each and every one of us will look into the mirror and ask ourselves, where are we and how do we want to end up? What kind of spiritual life do we want to have? And I pray that, Lord, that we'll be like King David, a man after your own heart, who will do everything that has been asked of him. And I pray that, Lord, we will practice these disciplines that we find to be important. Prayer, fasting, meditating, confessing, worshipping, um, solitude, and the many different disciplines in which we need to put into practice so that we can become the man or the woman that you will require us to be. So we submit this into your loving, tender hands. We ask that your Holy Spirit will spur us on to deeper and greater faith. For this we ask in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.